Greetings, folks. Um, PCI 2.0. I still feel really dirty. Um, we're talking about PCI at DEF CON. What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, seriously, what the fuck? Again, this is the worst part. Um, last year, a few of you actually saw the beginning of this in the hackerspace at uh, ShmooCon, and then here. Um, man, this is disgusting. Somebody's, somebody is sodomizing uh, the fun of our industry. It's Bob Russo uh, and, and a few other people. Uh, so I don't know what the state of Twitter is, and I don't know where my pants are, and my cell phone is in my pants, and that's how I follow Twitter. So, uh, but Well, we, we'd intended to have another screen up with the Twitter thing so that you could all be making fun of us, but it turns out that we only use the second screen for the game show thing. And These people don't need Twitter or another screen to make fun of us. Good point. All heckling must be done live and in person. Feel free to heckle on Twitter if AT&T has any packets moving for your phone. So, Mine, not yeah. so much. Compliance is changing the way companies do security. That's changing the way we attack them and the way we defend them. Um, I need to make a quick disclaimer before we get into the official disclaimer. PCI is awesome. Uh, DISA <laughs> STIGs are awesome. Uh, CIS standards are awesome because it got me an awesome, cool job this year with a cool company making even more money, having even more fun um, drinking at DEF CON. And any of you that aren't making more money, haven't got a new job, aren't having fun in the business or doing it wrong, um, I don't know how long it's going to last. We should have some fucking fun with this while it lasts. Um, <laughs> but moving on, PCI at DEF CON again. Hey, raise your hand if you saw the PCI DEF CON talk last year. And, and you came I'm back. I'm sorry. Back. Wow. Oh, wow. So here thinking? we are. This is a bunch of crap. You know who we are. Sexy Dave Shackelford, Josh Gorman, Mercurial, who's always on stage somewhere, uh, <laughs> Alex Hutton, and uh, Martin McKay. Uh, usual disclaimers, we do not speak for our employers, clients, yada, yada, yada. The dog will back me up as long as I take her out for bagels and coffee in the morning and she's more interested in the bagels. Uh, these are our opinions, facts are as we see them. We are not lawyers. The XQSAs on this stage are not your XQSAs. However, as I like to remind them, QSA, um, PCI is kind of like the blood in Macbeth. You can pretend to wash it off, but you never come clean. <laughs> So, deja vu all over again. Here we are again. Last year we talked about a lot of PCI issues. This, we, this year we want to give you something to uh, move forward with. What's changed? 2.0, baby. Three-year cycle. Um, Three-year cycle. Well, that's, that gives us time to uh, get thoroughly owned. Nothing has changed, Jack. Wait, no, it's... There's a new number. It, no, no, I've looked at the numbers. Look, what look I'm like. a product manager for a company, and when we make big changes, we shift like a, like a decimal point and stuff because it tells people that something happened, no, that no, we're no. proud of our work. But the PCI, and the PCI Council is some smart people who are incestuous with the scanning industry. Oh, shit. Um, no, Jack, <laughs> Jack, Jack, remember, the PCI panel does not, I mean, the PCI council does not work like other corporations. When they change to 2.0, they say, we're going to freeze things exactly like they are right now for three years and not change a thing. If only Congress worked that way, because, you know, PCI council, when they're bought, they stay bought. <laughs> okay. So what is new in 2.0, Martin? Nothing? Very, very little that's of importance other than the things that are not actually written in the um, PCI 2.0. Wasn't there some, some virtualization? I mean, that's new technology, right? I'm waiting for the, uh, the working. I'm working for the, the, the working group on OS2 Warp is almost done, right? <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So last year 2.0 was new, it was fresh, it was sexy, it was frustrating, it was lacking in concrete guidance. Uh, um, thankfully, mobile devices don't count. Um, none of us carry anything more powerful than a laptop we got issued by corporate two years ago in our pocket. If we knew where our pants were, we'd know where our pockets were. Um, 
<laughs> so, oh. where the hell are we now? Do you want my pocket? <laughs> Do you know where that's been? <laughs> Speaking of which. Okay, so. so thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> Wrong way. Wrong way. Yep, no, I know, I don't know. Yep. So uh, who, who wants to talk? Uh, Mr. Corman. Mr. Corman, do you have any opinions about PCI? So without rehashing everything, I mean, I'm uh, just a level set. Um, about a year and a half ago, I compared PCI to the No Child Left Behind Act for IT security. And then uh, we had a bunch of debates Bullshit. and dialectics, and I think we did some pretty good discussion. We got, you know, I created an enemy, Mike Don, then we hugged it out for charity, and now we're pals. And no tongue. No tongue. Um, but we, um, I think we advanced the discussion a lot. We took it from blind hatred or blind faith to some sort of informed discussion. But um, this, the other guy who did the Verizon DBIR is going to say some more things, but I have three slides from this year's DBIR. So first off, if Bob Bruce is going to stand on the, de the deck of an aircraft carrier, this is the mission accomplished flag he will fly behind him. And basically it's because if you look at the sheer number of breached records each year, um, the high was 2008 with 360,000, and yes, there's selection bias, and yes, it's just Verizon and U.S. Secret Service, and Alex will cover that. But we dropped a hundredfold in two years. That, so that's three. PCI, right? No. 360 million. Wait, no, wait, wait. No, for no, it. wait for it. So wait for it. So although we dropped from 360 million breached records down to 3.8 billion, you know that that's a hundredfold drop. Um, but remind, I might need to remind you that my mother-in-law's credit card as a record counts the same as the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter plans. So this has led lots of fanboys to say mission accomplished, right? PCI is working. Now there's all sorts of things that we don't have enough data for, but another fact is, you know, the street price of a credit card has dropped about a hundredfold as well. It's not causation, but you know, we have to look at this in the big picture. So click one more time, please. I'm so, supposed to do my job? So thanks to the really good work that we're, now that we're measuring things and capturing what we can, I did a little year-to-year -year comparison. So the number of breaches went way up. We went from 141 to 761. And at the same time, the number of records went way, way down. Well, and that, that's important, Josh. So right, yeah. everybody think about risk. Risk is both impact records and frequencies. Risk so has nothing to do with trading, PCI. Now we're just trading um, records for a greater frequency, a yeah. huge increase in frequency. So lots more failures, but lots smaller, which should make us feel good. But when you dive into the types, and this is really important, the intellectual property went from 10 fails to 41. National security data went from 1 to 20. It's, you can read for yourself, right? So some of these higher value targets, um, I used to usually draw a continuum. On one end is highly replaceable, and on, on the other end is irreplaceable. And credit cards tend to be fairly replaceable, low value. So there are shifts and there are changes, and we know about them because the DBIR is measuring them, and we're looking for year-to-year -year trends. But I didn't get comfort and mission accomplished. I saw that there's some much more serious failures. One more, I think. So, you know, the, in, in parallel, we keep talking about is it working or isn't it, but the scope of PCI is regulated card data. Um, in parallel with that, we saw a lot more intellectual property theft, whether it was Google Aurora, you know, or cyber kitten killing APT nonsense. Um, RSA Secure ID is a big frickin' deal. You just killed right? a cat. I just killed several cats. Kittens, dead. You used APT. You know, we, in parallel with PCI being debated of is it or isn't it working, I think it's an irrelevant question because we now have much more serious espionage on the one hand, which has nothing to do with PCI, and we have um, the anonymous and lulsec debate like we had earlier today, which is they could care less that you're PCI compliant. So it's a, slice, it's a small slice of the overall risk management that's taken way too much of our risk time and budget. So with that, I'll transition to, uh, well, I'm a bitch right now, though, because that's how I roll. You're a bitch right now? Yeah, no, seriously, because, I mean, you know, I, well, and Josh and I have had our discussions here, but, I mean, d despite the catastrophic loss of people's PlayStation network access, Realistically, you know, impact to me has to have some more tangible meat to it. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll hold that thought for a minute. Uh, it's Alex's slide next. So it's not all bad, and you can hand me the pig if you want, but the truth is, as much as we hate to admit it, um, PCI really has kind of moved us forward. Um, 
there are a bunch of people that would do nothing if it weren't for the threat. Um, and so it's moved us forward. And we can't forget that. And one of the things that we can't forget that... Um, yeah, but Jack, that, Jack, uh, I mean, I've, I've looked at some of the data, and 2010 versus 2011, I don't... Or actually, I should say 2009 versus 2010, I think we've quit moving. That, I that, that's entirely possible. We, I, we I, could I, have... Um, we, there was some movement, and you know, one of the things that needs to be said, and Mike's not here, but one of the points that gets made by people that defend PCI, and they have a valid point, is that if I am an irresponsible merchant, you, as a responsible merchant, can get sodomized by my bad practices, because I lose a bunch of credit cards, and somebody uses them at your shop, you're out the money. Because, um, as Mr. Arlen pointed out eloquently last year, this is not an egalitarian system. This is a group of um, thugs, hoodlums. <laughs> I, I, think, I think I Jamie is criminals. I, I think it's important to note that the, the, the people who promulgate the problem, and, and the problem is a system that was dying, designed in the 50s um, in order to make it easy to pay for your restaurant and hotel meals when you're away from your home, um, is no longer sufficient when you have to... Wow, that's a weird echo. It's really weird. Uh, when you have to <laughs> deal with... The monitors are coming in and out. If anyone in AV cares, the monitors are coming in and out. I think they're doing that to us on purpose. Um, the, the, the issue, though, really is that the system was designed from an, an IT perspective in the dawn of time, and no significant movement has been made to take advantage of any new technology you know, you can say that adding CVV was a real win, and CVV2 is so much better, but 16 digits plus expiry plus CVV plus whatever other fraud controls we try to tack onto the back end, you still have to pick up a copy of the operating regulations and look at them and say, you know what? Every time someone in this casino asks me to see photo ID to go with my visa card, they're violating their merchant agreement, makes me want to scream my frickin' head off because they're not paying attention to the operating agreement, why the hell are they going to pay attention to PCI? They've created this situation where the only way that you can acquire the problem is by being one of their customers, and the only way you can acquire the solution to their problem is by being one of their customers. I, I know people who do this. They also offer you cement shoes as an option. Can I ask a question to the crowd before we let um, Alex say intelligent things? Is everybody down with that? No, not that this isn't intelligent, of course, but, but I'm, just, I'm just curious. Oh, nice, nice. Um, so, because I think it's important to level set. I think it's easy for a bunch of people to get up on a panel and kind of rant about something and go, ah, this sucks, and, you know, we're all kind of disgruntled, ranty security people. Um, but just to get a show of hands, if anybody's brave enough, would any of you actually go so far as to say that the institution of compliance mandates such as PCI with its structure and everything else has somewhat improved perhaps your budgeting ability and or potentially your entire security program? That's a pretty damn good number, actually. I mean, that, which goes to say that just getting up here and, and bitching about the existence of it is not probably a great idea. So, Alex? <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Uh, one of the cool things about my last job was I got to be neutral. I got to play actual researcher, which was kind of hot. Um, and we took a look at a couple of things. First, we looked at incidents, right? The actual outcomes. We didn't have these masturbatory sessions about does it make you secure or not secure. We looked at the outcomes. Um, the second thing is we looked at um, our customers um, and we looked at how difficult it was for them to actually become and maintain compliance. So two separate reports that we did really examining this stuff. These pie charts, sorry everybody who likes St Stephen Few, these pie charts are showing you that it's not easy to become compliant. If you don't know what an IROC is, um, I don't know why you're here. No, um, it's initial report on compliance, okay? Um, what these pie charts are showing is how difficult it is to even, if you say, once you call, well, Martin in his past life and, and other QSAs and say, okay, we think we're ready for an IROC, hooray, 
this is what you end up with, at least with us as a QSA. Next slide. And, and I wrote about 10 to 20 percent of the reports that that is based on, so in a previous life. Right. So, so yay, it, it, it's hard. So is it worth it? Next slide. We have no idea. <laughs> right? We don't know how to measure secure. There are no secure units. We have indicators. We have shadow metrics that we can start thinking about. But it's a pain in the ass. Um, so what we can do is look at the data. Next slide. All right. And we can look at this. Essentially, when we talk about the outcomes, we talk about what's happening in the threat landscape. Right? First, is it a targeted or opportunistic attack? Um, year over year, we see an 80-20 split. Weird way that nature works, right? We see an 80-20 split between targeted and opportunistic attacks. Yeah, it's a subjective measurement. All measurements subjective to some degree get over it. Second, we ask our, our incident response guys to characterize the attacks. We give them some guidelines and so forth. And generally, they're mostly moderate, low to none. Um, just to give you a kind of a, a thumbnail there, low is something that even Josh and I could car carry out. <laughs> Next slide. Maybe. Next slide. All right. So what do I mean? And this is where this sort of, uh, if you start arguing with me about, well, gee, PCI, you, you, PCI doesn't mean you're secure, um, this is the first it doesn't freaking matter slide. Because what we found when we, when we really looked at incidents is that if you have default credentials on your point of sale system, right, you're going to get breached. You're already breached if you have micros anywhere in your username or password, all right, and you've got that as a point of sale vendor, for example. So take a look here. This is just very simple, basic stuff that PCI compliance should have, go back to the opportunistic and targeted, should have, if it were in place, perhaps driven the attacker from opportunistic to targeted. So the point being, 80% of the time, people screwed up. We screwed up somehow. Either we didn't educate the customers, the customers got lazy because we're not educating them, we had a, a, a problem where we deployed something, there was just variance from good practices or standard practices or whatever you want to call, cause it. But none of this stuff is O'Day, right? None of this stuff is particularly tricky. Next well, slide. Alex, can I wait, ask a quick wait, question to the audience? Yeah. Right. How many of you have been out on, uh, on the uh, casino floor and noticed that the POS systems have been down several times? I mean, not that that's unusual no. during DEF CON, <clears throat> but it might show a little bit of a microcosm of They're PCI. Of not just POS here, though, right? It's not single point. It's, it's not just here. Entire no, might, corporate that, networks even. throughout the city of Las Vegas have been going down when individual well, systems have gone down. But it's not, it, according to what I've heard, it's not even oh, yeah. just, oh, yeah. just specific to us. Apparently, there's five or six different casinos that their POS systems go down all at the same time for five or six hours. So what does that tell you? Maybe they have the same service provider that is really screwing up the back end. Well, that and if that way all the failure is in one place. That's kind of handy for us, right? Yep. I, I, before I advance the slide, I do want to say one thing about the, the simple... Versus. One of the things that uh, Josh has made very clear in a variety of presentations, and, and several of us have, is that you know years ago we used to say you only, only had to outrun the bear, and uh, whoever you were with might be kind of fat and slow, and they would feed the bear. There are too many bears now, but one of the things that this shows is you should tie your shoelaces because there's no point in tripping over your own damn shoes and making it easy for the bears. Um, the bears like us uh, lean and having run and healthy, you know. Um, uh, so there, I'll so, shut up. Go ahead, go ahead, man. Ever? You, I can hear you all repeat it. Okay. Just uh, yell. So what is the point of PCI other than reinforcing common sense? <laughs> right. So it's, do you remember Jack said? That, that okay, common sense has nothing thing. to do with PCI. Now let's there's repeat the, the question. Let's repeat the question. About, right? Repeat the question so for everybody. The, okay, so it's what is the point of PCI? Other than just common sense. Uh, well, budget. Well, you know, there's, that's a really complex question, okay? Within no, the context not. of establishing controls, right? 
if we wanted to be diplomatic about it, we would say it is to take a population that had wild variants, it's to get them some consistency, and see if that actually reduces frequency or impact. Or, okay. if we were or, more well, cynical, we would say that it's just to keep the government out of the... the yeah, I wasn't going to go there, but yeah. Regulation. Yeah, I personally... From the card brands. Yeah. I have no... Yeah, I have no comment on that, but Jamie probably does. Jamie might have an opinion on something a little bit more sinister about what the reason a PCI was. Please be sinister. Sinister? It's actually not that hard, you know. It's sinister, true, what the fuck, you know. Think about how all this started. I mean, th this is my usual rant about how most of us failed to study history and therefore we're doomed to repeat it. The card brands came up with a way to transfer the bulk of their liability and risk to the issuing banks. The issuing banks were not so fond of this situation, so they found a way to transfer the, most of the liability and risk to the merchants. Who's next? Back to Alex. All right. So remember when I mentioned consistency, right, and whether or not that would affect security. So this column, I don't know if you can see this in the back, guys, but it's available online and stuff. All right. The white columns there, 08, 09, 010, those are when the incident response guys go in, they actually have to do a mini assessment of the environment they're in. So they go through each requirement and they just do a, yeah, I would have passed here or there's no way in hell I would have passed you. All right, so those numbers are basic. Yeah, there's, those are our percent that would have passed, okay? So under 2010, requirement one, install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect data 82% of the time the incident response guy said to the card brands, there's no way you would consider these guys in compliance with just having that basic requirement set. This is what I mean when I said, it ain't even close, kids. My firewall's in a box in my data center, and three mice live in it. Basically. The so great are they maintaining your change control processes? So let me, let me jump in here. Um, I might know a little bit about firewalls and how they're used in the real world. If um, they are. Not, any, not anymore. Um, I've, I've erased that all in six weeks. Let, let's back up. What Al, let's reiterate what Alex said. 18% of the time for people that came up in this, this set of investigations, they had installed and maintained a firewall and configured it so that it protected their systems. Think about that for a minute. Now, we like to make fun of firewalls and antivirus because they don't work and they're obsolete technology. And I've made this plea before. Before we give up on obsolete technology, decades old technology, uh, those of you who know where I work, I work with a gentleman who, well, a gentleman may be the wrong word, uh, who wrote the first commercial firewall, first stateful packet firewall. Um, just once before we retire obsolete technology, could we deploy it properly, please? It might even work that way. Alex, I'm sorry. I no, just, no, that's fine. Fire, last... Firewalls get me all excited. You can't tell because of what I'm wearing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> so um, you can see here that uh, th there is a little bit of sample weirdness between 08, 09, and 010 because of the, the nature of the merchants involved, many more level 3, level 4 merchants in 010. But it doesn't matter. We're looking for that consistency, right? Um, in, in terms of security. Now that gray bar is our PCIR data, and that was at IROC, right, at initial report on compliance, were they good or not, okay? So that is, that is yet, it's difficult. How difficult is it when you want to be compliant without help? And then the uh, other columns represent basically how difficult was it for these pe poor people to maintain compliance? And you can draw a lot of conclusions from that. I'm not going to draw them. I want you guys to think about them and come up and ask questions and talk about it. All right? But this is, I think, really interesting data when you look at PCI itself and you divorce yourself from the fact that it doesn't protect from O'Day and that antivirus is next to useless and blah dee blah dee blah that we talk about on our blogs and our podcasts and all that stuff. Thank you very much. You know, Mike Dunn's not here, but he made a really excellent point recently. He said... Um, when he got into PCI, he thought it was going to take people who didn't care about security at all and didn't have a roadmap for how to do it, and it would show them how to do these common sense things, to your point. And now what he's concluded after having enough data 
is that you can't make someone who doesn't care about card data care about it. In those cases, they may achieve compliance at the rock, and the data showed, at least I haven't seen this year's, but last year's data showed they lapsed within one to two months after. No, that's not what it showed because it doesn't doesn't measure that, Josh. I mean, it... it I'm, I'm quoting him, so you, you, you fix it then. If it's broken, fix it. It, it doesn't capture that sort of, sort of sh snapshot because it really does only look year over year. Okay. And I have looked at some of the data for 2010 as opposed to 2009, and that's what scares me is, is Mike is right. When he thought originally that PCI would give some impetus to people who didn't care or who couldn't get budget, to be able to get that budget, in a lot of cases, there was some movement originally. There was some movement when they first started to become PCI compliant. Unluckily, it stopped. Mm -hmm. There really hasn't been any more movement. The people who want to be secure, the people who want to be the businesses that, that look at security as a sales point are becoming secure. The businesses that are, are trying to not be secure, trying not to spend the money on PCI, are finding ways to fool the auditors, are finding ways to just ignore the whole system. Compliance hacking for the win. I, I would ask one thing, though, too. I mean, you know, we're talking about people that want to become secure. What about those that, quote unquote, want to become compliant? And the fact that that doesn't mean you're secure at all. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of people that want to check the box. They don't want to be fined. Okay. How many people out here still think that security equals compliance? Anybody? That's a bait. That's, that's, that's terrible. I'm sorry. Hey. I'm sorry, Marty. Was it 2004? 1998? Back when you were still young? So yeah. theoretically, I'm a moderator, but actually I'm an immoderator, and this is where I'll jump in and... Don't make assumptions based on where I may have been for the past four years, because I've seen a lot of other things, but sometimes people cheat. One of the things that I saw that was kind of interesting was somebody had a problem with a, a certain piece of malware tearing their network up. Um, because I was familiar with the system they were running, I noticed an interesting icon. They had an exclusion for IPS that excluded IPS from their NTP server. Now, if you've seen H.D. Moore's talk from a couple of years ago about the interesting information that you can leak out of NTP, you might think maybe that's a bad idea. But it's still just an NTP server. But I noticed it was actually the icon that the particular system they were using in this IPS system was an icon for a network, not an individual host. The network definition that was used for exclusions, not just in IPS, but also in web content filtering and some other places on this particular um, not customer, that would be irresponsible of me, um, this random person um, happened to be 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 slash zero. Love that subnet. However, um, Wait, is this the pick on ISC squared or some other certification body? We could easily uh, go there. No, no, that's we another could go talk. there. That's fine. Uh, but it, it got past the auditor, and uh, so they kind of forgot that they had um, created an exclusion for their compromised NTP server that covered the entire network, and then they were whining that, that having defeated all of their security systems, uh, they were owned inside out, upside down. And actually the call started because their exchange server was creating too many alerts on uh, some defensive system that we make fun of. But sometimes people cheat. Um, anybody in this room that has done penetration tests has probably find it. Anybody that uh, does defensive stuff has probably seen this. But it turns out that uh, not every QSA cares as much as some of the ex-QSAs on this panel and some of you in front of me. Some of the QSAs, and this is an un unpopular decision, these guys are trying to make a living. Um, they may or may not be competent, but uh, they may have a mortgage. They may have an ex-wife or ex-husband or two that requires, you know, support, and they have bills and they need to pay them, and uh, they churn the stuff. Um, PCI compliance has become commoditized, and that drives people into uh, cutting corners. But Jack, does, does the fact that people sometimes cheat on compliance change anything? Does it mean it's more effective, less effective? Does it mean anything, really? Because those same people are going to cheat no matter what, aren't going to spend money no matter what. 
it, I, it matters mm -hmm. if you I'm think compliance me. equals security. And while nobody that's here would believe that, um, the people that have budget authority sometimes still do. But this is where I get angry. We look at it like it's no harm, no foul. But like, I, I tend to work with a lot of CISOs over the last couple of years. They tend to be on Fortune 100, Fortune 500. And a guy I knew who used to do good risk management, I, the question I've been asking for the last two years since we started this debate is how, what percentage of your security budget goes to passing an audit on card data and which percentage goes towards your corporate secrets? And a Fortune 50 company has zero dollars on corporate secrets. He went from doing balanced risk management to 100% on the card data. He pays $2.6 million for the assessment each year. It's not like he would have done different necessarily security controls, but it has defocused him from things that matter more. So it's not zero impact. Yeah, it helped some, and it was a very massive distraction to many others. Well, I, I would say, okay. No, I was just going to say, I, th this is the speed limit test to me, right? I mean, how, how many of you speed? There you go, exactly, right? So, but there are, in fact, radar guns out there, right? And you know this, but you still speed. And, and it's the same concept. You know, if, if, if there was no radar gun, what would happen? Well, hang on a second. Let's look at the economic incentive disincentive model. I mean, if, you, if you're failing, what's the cost? Eh, you might get $100,000 a year fine. Or you might be told that your per transaction fee is going up for, by 2%. I, I'm not paying my per transaction fee, my customers are. Um, that fine is one-tenth or one-one-hundredth of what it would take to fix it. Let me, I, am, am I going to spend 100 times? Could you re repeat times? the comment on competitiveness? You can't, you, can't pass the pass, you, you can't pass the 2% to your customer if you want to compete with Walmart. Wow, th this is commoditized? Is that what you're saying? Are you saying that... But, yeah, but those guys can't compete with Walmart anyway. <laughs> an extreme example... To but, an extreme well, I'm, I'm not in Walmart's market. They don't sell what I sell, so pff, screw it. My customers are all stupid. But, Aren't your customers stupid? All right. As outspoken Ouch. as I am, I'm not going to call out no. any of the companies that sell Walmart-grade PCI services, but because oh. Oh. everyone oh. here knows who they are, and one of my gripes, and it's safe now that some of my friends are no longer at the company that they worked for that created a cool report that would have been much more cool if it had called out who had certified them people as PCI compliant when they were breached. <laughs> but that's politically incorrect. You know, a couple of times in other talks, people have talked about attribution. This morning, Josh and company were talking about attribution in a completely different context. It would really be cool to know who is certifying people PCI compliant yes, it would be really as cool. they are yeah, currently look, heavily compliant. Hold on, hold on, Jack. I know, I'm not defending former no, employers no, of anybody on no, the no, panel, I, but I'm not saying that it's an option that to be, do. That shouldn't be the that shouldn't be the vendor's job, right? No. Everybody out here who came, who's interested in PCI, you have a right to go to the card brands and make some freaking noise. Uh, you do, honestly. You should. You have well, a responsibility, right? F so the lack the of and and you should continue to the lack of transparency. You shouldn't push that on, on some vendor who's doing their best to get there and has an uh, evil legal and PR department. I'm just kidding, Brandon. You're awesome. No, it, um, but you should be going to the card brands and saying, where's my damn transparency? If you're really interested in me being secure or my customers being secure, then I want to see reports. Anonymization can work. We do it all the freaking, or we, a, a former employer, I did it all the freaking time. But, but hang on. The can work, the, and it's informative, and it's you, there. They have a responsibility if they're interested in security, but that gets back to Jamie's point. Right. But I, you skip past the I, economic I don't, incentive I don't argument. Want to, let, me, let me state the name. So Verizon has given us more data. You can, make, you can throw stones at Verizon for putting the, the, the VZ name on things, but they've shared data freely. They're, just because I want more data that's not politically or logically or financially feasible for them to provide. Uh, just because I want it doesn't mean I get it. I was just expressing that. But it would be really cool if a lot of people shared a lot more data 
not to sound all like new school of information security, but it'd be cool to Yay. know what the fuck is going on in our business, not just with compliance, so maybe we could make an educated decision. You, sir, I think have something to say. Well, you talk about the, the Walmart approach to um, vendors doing... 17 cents an IP. Doing what? PCI validations, okay? And I think that's an easy, easy target to go after. But you have to remember that the PCI validation is a point in time, mm -hmm. right? And <laughs> the people you're working with, they want to be compliant at that time when you're on site doing the validation. After that, who knows what the hell happens? Um, certainly on clients that you go back to year after year, they fall down during whatever, you know, whatever time period, <laughs> where it's months or you know, half a year or three quarters of a year, they fall down during that time because they're not worried about what is going to show up on their validation report. So, right, so, so not to get myself in trouble, but that whole validation versus ongoing compliance thing, that, that's, that's a red frickin' herring, dude. As long as, as long as they can say there has never been a breach where the customer has been PCI compliant or the victim has been PCI compliant, it is a completely red herring, and I promise you that that will continue to be the case indefinitely. You know, like that, that's that's true. But we've I can say I have a unicorn in my pants while not wearing pants too. I mean, we're talking about the PCI panels. So, we've I mean, kind PCI of ignored the, uh, the the pen testing professionals in the room. Are there any pen testing professionals in the room? Okay. So one of the things that uh, we've been talking about at B sides a lot was the pen testing execution standard, the P test thing. And speaking of the wall martification mm -hmm. of uh, this, it's really the, the race to the bottom to see who can make the auditor go away or what's the fastest, cheapest path to IROC or ROC rather. Um, people are, because it's so ill defined on what counts as a penetration test, a, a quick Nessus scan is often substituted. Right? Nessus, save as PDF right, it's, it's for the win. Now, the re, one of the re, I know P test is still controversial, but one of the reasons I like it is it helps separate the, the, um, check the box for minimum type person from cannibalizing the talent that real professional ten testers can bring. It, it starts to help articulate or, or support the conversation for if you saw Wendy's talk on how she'd like to be penetrated as a CISO. Um, <laughs> it helps her know what she's gonna get. If she really wants to focus on a more comprehensive thing, she can now use it as a, a framework to decide which pen tester she's going to contract with. So it lets the irresponsible jackasses who want a cheap solution to be irresponsible and cheap, and it lets someone who actually wants to use the PCI budget to drive better security Naturally. do so. So I, Wendy can describe her fetishes. I, I, I was just gonna say, so let's, let's take what Josh, I, I mean, Josh has a valid point, but let's take what's on the slide right now, which by the way, does in fact have a younger Bill Murray, which everybody should, of course, be focused on right now. Um, but but let's let's actually take that as a good example. Um, it, it's so easy to to swing the needle to to things like you know p tests and pen testing and and you know this cutting edge thing or mobile security or, or you know insert Cloud. bullshit here. Cloud. Look, simmer down, guy. Cloud. Don't don't have a moment next to me. Um, so, <laughs> what's on this slide is relevant though. Seriously, I'd love to talk cutting edge. We're at a conference that focuses on cutting edge, right? Somebody that spent six to seven months in their basement with a lot of Mountain Dew and a debugger, right? Get away from that. Let's go to the, the, the regular baseline crap. Patching, config management, Firewalls. I mean, I think Alex's data was actually poignant. Is is really relevant here. I, I mean, it's 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 incredibly easy to point fingers and say, you know, we're we're doing a crappy job, or we're shifting blame, or we're doing all these things. But who the hell is doing a great job of patching? I I, I you know, you raise, I raise my hand when you ask who who's a pen testing professional. I, I like I like breaking into places. It's great fun. And and people ask me very commonly, you know, how are you getting in? What are you doing? How do you get in there? And I'd love to be the guy that sits up here and tells you, ah, yeah, I'm sitting in my basement and I'm developing custom exploits and like I've got the debugger, it's really fun. No, it's actually like default passwords and that one dumbass in ops that forgot the MS08067 patch on the one box, right? And, and you know what? We are losing because of that. Okay, but let's, let's take a look here. PCI is meant specifically to look at credit card data. Nothing else. It's not about security. So then, Hey, wait. 
Wait, let me where, finish. Let me finish. You can let finish, let finish, finish after after I do, because like what? I'm wearing white, uh, except what? for the strawberry stains. So PCI is about card data, but we need to. PCI is about securing card data. How PCI is PCI's awesome, but we're in Nevada. I just wanted to point out we're in Nevada, well, so PCI is data, not just about, about card security. data. It's not about security. It's about card data. That's all it's ever been about. It's about securing card data. It, it, something about security. But why are we even taking card data? I mean, why are most of these people even having access to their card data? If we really <laughs> want to have something that's going to protect the card data. Don't have it. Don't have it. Don't ever let these yeah. merchants touch it. Don't ever let the merchants see it. Quite frankly, oh, yeah, you then have... The, then the Graham Leach Bliley risk is on the card brands and the banks. And the we still need that. to well, provide 16-digit expiry and CVV so that you can take a taxi in Azerbaijan. This is not going to change anytime soon until we're willing to admit that creating a duplicate system that does not use technology from before my parents were born is going to be useful. When we switch to something that's I'd like to new, point out his parents are old, so that's a long time ago. And WAF can save us all, though. And, He's old, too. And, and if we move to something new that is appropriately designed, probably not by a card company, and implemented with an economic incentive that says, if you want to use the old system, great. Get used to the spread between what we're charging you for interest and what the overnight rate is. Redefine usury. And... We're going to make it possible for both sides to, to look at the situation and go, oh, heck yeah. From, from the employer's perspective, or not the employer, sorry, the, the, from the acceptor's perspective, we're going to make this real simple. Um, if you want to use old style, great. It's $2 a transaction plus 2.5%. And if you want to use the new style system, it's $0.08 cents per transaction flat rate. But we've already seen that chip and pin is also being broken, so that's not necessarily going to save us you much. You think chip and pin is a good idea when they print the same fucking 16-digit number on the chip and pin card mm -hmm. with the same fucking mag track on the back? I'm saying we need a new system. The old one is costing us a shit ton in interest. So the, the overnight rate is less than 1%. The average credit card rate is 22 plus. I, I think we got the 10-minute warning, we sh and we said we were going to oh, offer crap. solutions. So should we so shift to solutions? We should... Talk, but let's. Uh, we will let's solve all your problems that, in the next ten minutes. In un other words, unlike uh, unlike last year, uh, we are in a place that has high ceilings and good air conditioning, so the smells better. But we also have room for uh, a couple hundred people in the Q and A session, so I encourage you to come there. That said, yeah, la gentleman. last year's Q and A session was off the freaking hook. It was, it was actually that? much better. It was than the much panel. better than this. Yeah. yeah. Most this of us gentleman, weren't there. This gentleman has an opinion, as does everyone else here, but he stood up, so. So I have an opinion, I have a question. Um, we're talking about things like just you know, patching systems, which are really, really important and relevant, by the way, with the number of people that don't even have a firewall coming I mean, who are patching, you know, have it configured properly. Um, but since we're talking about the cards a little bit now, I'd like to ask, um, when the fuck are we going to move away from using a physical signature? Didn't I just say like, that? Like, Oh. 16 digits, expiry, CVV. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys yeah. still use checks in this country, for Christ's sake. Exactly. Sane people have had debit cards for 30 years. Exactly, exactly. I, I completely agree. So, okay, well. What, once the... Once the government no, of uh, East Asia or Aptland or whatever issues us all federal it. IDs, we'll just use that for signatures. Um, somebody just said, well, it's expensive to change out infrastructure. Um, there's a, a, we'll call it the equivalent of Walgreens in the country that I'm from, uh, who've gone through three entire iterations of pin pads in less than 18 months because of foolish business decisions. They went from the old style pin pads to the new ones that were um, chip and pin, and then they realized that another branch of the same organization put out a credit card that had an RFID on it, and they couldn't use their own goddamn credit card in their own goddamn stores, so they changed all their pin pads again. So you know what? When the difference is 22 plus percent versus under 1% for the overnight rate, there's lots of money in that interest spread to take care of replacing the whole system. And remember, those economic incentives matter. Debit card transactions are measured in cents per transaction, fixed price. Credit card transactions are measured in a mixture of fixed price plus percentage price. Um, change the economic incentives in both directions. Make it so that if I use the new modern system that doesn't have every vulnerability known to man and require fraud management of hundreds and hundreds of people per issuing bank, um, say it very simply to the customer, I'm only going to charge you 9% interest. Which card is the customer going to choose to use? The old assy one or the new fancy one? 
Let's. The, I mean, the solutions aren't aren't solutions that we can execute on. They're solutions that we can pressure towards once we get to the point where, as infosec professionals, we're doing our fucking job. But you're saying we also need to put pressure on the PCI Council and merchants to, in order to enact that change. I think the only uh, change you can do is the one. But how if we do control. it? Do the right thing, no matter what somebody else tells us to do. How about issuing banks and and the credit brands themselves? Okay. I mean, let, let's so, quit dumping this on the merchants because a hundred thousand. Yeah. Uh, 100,000 merchants aren't going to develop a better solution than three card brands. Right. Let's, that, let's that's grab not possible. One quick question and uh, give everybody a, a minute or so to wrap up, and then we'll go into the Q&A room. So you, uh, you keep coming back to this point that uh, PCI is all about the credit cards, and there's plenty of other information out there that yes. needs to be protected. And absolutely, your point about, hey, we need to replace the whole system, but that's going to take time. It's going to take money. So Two in the years, interim. No problem. Let isn't me it do a valid it. I'll point? show you how. It's cool. Whiteboard it for you. <laughs> Keep your pants in on. In the interim, until everybody Simmer gets on board and does that, you know, when, when somebody breaks in and steals, the, uh, steals a bunch of credit card numbers, it affects me, it affects, you know, my friends, my family, everybody in this room. And uh, maybe not directly, but maybe just through increased cost for all the goods we buy because all that fraud permeates the system and we all pay for it. When somebody breaks into some pharmaceutical, steals the, uh, the intellectual property for the next Viagra, doesn't affect me. So in the meantime, until we can get some new system in place, isn't there a, um, you know, a use for having something like PCI out there to, at least for the people who don't want to cheat, who do want to try to be secure but don't know how, give them these guidelines, the, okay, I used the wrong word, I'm sorry, not, not secure, but it, it show them what the common sense it. they should be already doing. If, if they don't know how to be secure without PCI, it's not going to help that much. CISSP, no, it's, buddy. It's, CISSP. That's exactly it. There's a lot of CISSPs out there. Who, we, we need a unicorn yeah, chaser what are you doing? at this point. But give them something to start with. No, it's, it's valid. It's a starting yeah. point. Yeah. And we, we can't deny that it's moved us forward, but we're so far behind that we we really need to look forward. Now, there are a lot of people that have budget because of that. I mean, the, the penetration testing industry is an industry because PCI requires it. Um, and with, with that, I really encourage everyone to follow up with us. I'd like to give everybody on the panel uh, a moment or so to wrap up. Um, this has been a follow-up to what we did last year. Hopefully, there's been more information. Uh, we will be in the Q&A room, and we really want to continue the conversation. We won't beat you to death. But with that, I'd, I'd like to start with Mr. Arlen and see if he has something to say. I, I doubt it because he is without opinion, as are everyone here. Uh, doing InfoSecRight.com. Also, you're all back in here at 8 o'clock for Hacker Pyramid, right? Yeah. Right. Hacker Mr. Shockford. Cleveland. Are you guys looking at me? Jesus. Um, you. Yeah, so, you know, bottom, bottom line, I mean, whatever. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that uh, don't, don't hit that, it's, John. It's That's really bad. Uh, you know, so, I, I mean, honestly, I, I'm ambivalent. Um, I see people that have really benefited from PCI. I see people that have, uh, I see people that have really benefited from just about any compliance measure. But uh, I also see the flip side of that, that people that just don't give a shit at all. And they look to get the auditors in, out, and move on to the next year. And, uh, you know, I don't think that us sitting here is, you know, and having this dialogue is going to get us there either. But, uh, you know, in some cases, I think it's a good thing. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be that, uh, you know, annoyingly optimistic guy on the panel, too. You know, I've seen a lot of environments. And there are some where people are doing PCI with the idea that it will make them secure, that they're trying to go beyond PCI and be secure. And they're actually doing some effective work. I've seen a lot of people who just haven't been able to get the budget before PCI came along. I've also seen a lot of companies where they look at PCI and go, it's another pain in our rear. Um, we're going to do the very minimum we can do to make, to make ourselves compliant. We're never going to be secure, so just give us our rock and go away. So I think if you understand the limitations and how defeatable even a fully compliant PCI environment is, then you have a baseline. And if you understand it's a very low baseline, only then are you able to look at the attack density, how people are getting popped, and prioritize how do you shift some of that budget. Now what Mike Don, Gene Kim, and I did a lot of work on was figuring out can, how do you massively reduce scope and have less data to lose and less systems involved in scope 
and that liberates funds to do protection of other non-scope, non-card data assets. So we have a lot of research and specifics behind that. But the trick isn't, you know, looking at that as a finish line. It's how do I, you know, budgetary jujitsu that, how do I use PCI to fund my visible ops project? Or how do I use it to pivot into non-card data security initiatives? But um, if you don't realize how limited and narrow it is in the first place, then those are off the table. I'll end with this. I can't give you guys a solution, but I can tell you how you can start to get at a solution, and that is demand transparency around data. You give smart people in this industry data, and we'll start to figure stuff out. But we are being kept ignorant, and you have to wonder if that isn't purposefully. We are debating something really quick. Don't move. Don't move. Okay, don't get all excited about them leaving yet because they're not going to. Our five o'clock speaker, who is? Crap, I should have looked that up before I started speaking, shouldn't I? That guy. We're in track one. Um, yeah, well, thank you. <laughs> My password is uh, full of fail. Jason Pittman is not going to be going from 5 to 520, so these guys are going to hang out till 520, and then after that, we've got another turbo talk. So. Or you could come Keep over going. to the Network Security Podcast and watch us uh, record episode 250. So, so can we have a round of applause for at least Martin? Don't everybody run away so at once. Let's, let's do, instead of going into the smaller room, we'll do Q&A because I'd be willing to bet some of you have opinions. Um, Martin's going to run away because he's doing the 250th episode of the Network Security Podcast. Let's uh, start Q&A here, and then we'll move into the other room and or commentary yes sir let's uh, let's dive in so one of the things that i found to be uh, kind of interesting about pci okay. yep. i guess from a introspective kind of way what are our failures as a community is that uh i mean i've been a former qsa and all that. i've seen a lot of environments for verizon business um is that our real challenge is operationalizing the process of security. And I think one of the things that PCI shows us with these failures is that is that, that is the problem. It's really hard. And I've, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your comments on that. Well, so it was, it was a commentary about operationalization of security. And one of the things that in my past that I've done is I, I've always worked with smaller businesses until recent career change. Um, and because we had to in small business, we operationalized. Some, somebody keeps giving me liquor. Um, so anyway, we did that to security in small business. Uh, like and it. it's because we had to, but larger enterprises kind of need to, and he knows something about that. I'm so. going to give a really quick, simple answer. Find me later, though. But uh, the, the visible ops studies that wasn't about really security, it was about IT operational excellence, showed massive deltas that the, the tighter you run your IT, the fewer break fixes, the faster mean time. It's basically like security is an accidental byproduct of really well-managed IT. So there are some studies that show high correlation, at least, to, um, to well, operationalizing IT with security in mind. I, I was going to say. There was a study at Weiss that's backing that data up again. So that's. Yeah. Well, here's, here's personal experience in that. I, I once upon a time ran a whole lot of security with uh, zero direct reports. I had about 187 indirect reports. And by making sure that security was everybody's job, because I'm a nice, friendly guy who buys a lot of coffee, um, I was able to achieve a level of security proceduralization um, that wasn't because you went to the security binder and looked at what to do, but because it was just your damn ops binder. Of course, we had binders then, too. Not SharePoint because it's. Yeah, but, and I'll just throw one thing on that too. I mean, if, if I started getting up here and talking in depth about change in configuration management, how many of you would still be fucking awake in about two minutes? <laughs> Woo! Config management, sexy. Man. None of you, right? At least the people that are being honest. And unfortunately, that's the most important stuff in terms of general opera, you know, opera. I can't even say that. Yeah. Opera, what he said. Operationalizing. IT and security in general, but I mean, that's the problem. We don't do a good job of that. Okay, Doing InfoSec, right? Ne next right. question. Um, next. Chad Sturgill. What's up, Alex? <gasps> hey, um, <clears throat> so love or hate PCI, it's kind of helped us out, but I think it's also prolonged the 
death of this archaic system, just like James yes. said. What do we do um, to shorten that lifespan of this broken system? Because it's all it's done is push the liability down. Let's not. Well, I already let's told not you, shorten Chad. it. Were we have zero percent unemployment in our industry. Let's not shorten this stuff. Let's not fix <laughs> anything. Know. Damn it. Because I love Chad. I've been working I, with Chad for a decade. I'd um, like to retire. You forever. have to ask for transparency, right? You have to have people fess up as here's how we were here's how we were screwed, right? And once you can say that, then somebody can say, well, look, now we know patterns in getting messed up, and let's solve those, what? and then you can start addressing real things versus crazy things. So, so my grade four teacher, Mrs. Barber, had this crazy way of making sure that we were doing the right thing all the time. She called it a snap quiz. Why do we book audits? Pop quiz. Why don't we just have them? You know, someday you walk in and the Spanish Inquisition shows up, I'm sorry, the PCI Inquisition shows up and says, you know what, we're going to find out whether or not you're compliant today. They do it for restaurants. Next. They do that in the credit union sector. We have audits year-round, or used to when I worked there. Yeah, yeah. Why, Self-congratulatory reach-around for the win. Why would, we do random, why would we do random audits and tests when we have anonymous and LulzSec? Uh, <laughs> boo. Next question. Hi. Hi, about that pretty dismal um, slide with the uh, percentage st uh, statistics on the, on the um, breached uh, organizations. Question on, about the firewall thing. Do you have any idea whether the uh, very low percentage of the uh, firewall compliance was due to the organizations actually not having a firewall at all, or was it because they failed to document the firewall rules as per PCI? Yeah, we lumped all of why would you fail requirement one. So it's documentation and so forth. But as we just said about operations being so damned important, there you go. Yes, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that PCI sets out great operational rigor. I'm just saying if it's 18%, that's indicative. Two, two follow-ups, though. One is they, had it at, they were compliant at one point prior. And two is, and we didn't say it because we didn't have time, but out of that 761, how many of them were SMBs with 11 to 100 employees? Uh, 400 and some odd so plus. So a lot of that is really describing a, the bottom of the market, level three, level four, and not necessarily equally applicable to large Yeah, but if you go back to a higher that, that's level right. one, level two. Large. Wait, wait. If okay, you go, go back ahead. to a higher level one, level two representation, yeah, it's still pretty abysmal. It's not 18%, yeah. but it's like 40%, you know? Right. Okay, thank you. Hey, guys. Uh, hey. Yeah. So, this is the last um, question. Uh, no, no. We've, until we move. No, we have, we, we have 20 minutes. We have another 15 or so. But yeah, oh, Because the next one can't. I, got somebody However, waving fingers at I just wanted to make a comment on the firewall thing. The, the situation that my friend Bob told me about that I mentioned earlier about IPS with that sp special NTP server. Bob. Um, Bob was told that uh, they normally just enable and disable those rules for the audits, and they forgot this time. <laughs> so that kind of focuses the, the, the sh that puts the spotlight on that 18 percent that we were talking about. They passed, a te they passed some sort of uh, scrutiny. And it doesn't have to be PCI. I, with, I do want to make that. Yeah, point. but with eighty plus PCI percent. is not the only thing that's doing crazy things. Re um, wait, wait, real quick. If you're coming in for the password talk, it's been canceled. Yes. Yep. The At five o'clock talk has um, the speaker was unable to make it. So this is PCI, as sexy as it is, and we're going to go a little bit long, and then we're going to go to the Q and A room. With that, sir, you have an intelligent and articulate question and or comment. Um, all right, so uh, one of you mentioned that um, uh, security, uh, does compliance equal security? And um, I would say that compliance is uh, a subset of security. So if you're secure, if you're, secure you're gonna be compliant. And I agree with you 100% that, that- That's, no, that, that's not necessarily yeah, true. Not necessarily yeah. true? No, okay. I, I've been in environments where we have been entirely compliant and completely unsecure. And I've been in environments where we're completely secure and completely non-compliant. Non because once you've got a set of rules that are proscriptive, mm -hmm. 
if you're trying to do something that's better than the proscriptive rule, you're doing it wrong. Well, there's yeah. also a perspective thing. I like to say PCI is, has nothing to do with security for any one individual company, but I don't know that we can make any sort of statement about effectiveness as we look at the population yet. But that's, well, that's the whole concept of con compensating controls, too, right? I mean, compensating controls could be really crappy ones that you're tweaking or really great ones that don't right. fit the So mold, you have you to write a document about compensating controls if you're using two-factor authentication to explain why you don't have good passwords. Okay. Um, of course, there's more to it than that, but um, I'm not defending and, and, it. And you know, saying. also compensating controls involves <laughs> Corvettes. No, wait, that's a different sort of compensation. Uh, but you know, Chris Hoff used to have a great diagram where he would show on a scale of one to ten how important this was to audit and how important it was to security. And you want to look for the ones that are high score for both, right? Some are distracting from your overall security program, and some of them are highly affinitized and aligned with. Good afternoon. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to address the panel. I actually represent, um, from a numbers perspective, that bottom of the barrel. We have 60 people in my organization. Um, I have an IT staff um, that I'm technically part of, even though I'm the security guy, and they look at me funny when I mention I'm also IT, of uh, five individuals. Uh, we've been um, we are also in the hospitality business, so we're in that segment of the population that's had a huge amount of breaches over the past year. You, you've changed all your default passwords on your point of sale systems and you don't use PC anywhere, right, please? If not, then sir, don't bother talking. <laughs> Go somewhere and do good. I, I've heard a lot about how PCI is awfully hard to maintain once you get it, and I say that's bullshit. The amount of work necessary to gain PCI is significantly higher than the amount of work to maintain it. Mm -hmm. Once you've gone through all the effort to, if you've done it right, <laughs> to, uh, that's well, a huge for, Well, for, for, your, for your portion of the sample, yeah. right, that, that may or may not be true, but I can guarantee you, um, from my experience with the top level one and two merchants, not so much. We're a top level one merchant, we're also a service provider. So we have to meet even more rigid standards than your top level one Yeah, but you got, you got 60 folks. Yeah, and, and real quick. Not 50,000. No. Uh, it's real, not a universally true statement. I mean, there, if you're doing I'm everything not perfectly, it's universally true. you still have to I'm prove just it saying every year. I'm hearing from you guys as if it's universally true that it's hard to do. No, it's fucking not, not if you do it right. It's neither hard to do nor is it easy to do. It's worthwhile to do. If, if I had insinuated that it was universally true, if I had insinuated that how we do it, if I had insinuated that I thought it was universally true, then I'm a bad statistician and I apologize. Um, I think what I was stating was here was the data that showed an overwhelming proportion that it is difficult. No, that's a misrepresentation of what that data is. It's a drastic simplification of what that data is. I, that yeah, data yeah, shows I, that people I, chose I'd like not to, to, not that it was hard to do. Please don't It, it may be easy in certain environments, but I think the data is pretty clear that right, for a lot of people it is, of it is not. But it would right. be good to, to take this into the Q&A room and let, yep. Offline, let the Offline, here comes the hook. Thank you. Thank you, though, because you do make a good point. That, that Actually, that point addresses something that's been made before, which is that for some organizations, PCI is uh, holding us back. But uh, sir, you have a question and a microphone. Yeah, so you're right, Jack. PCI has made a lot of people a lot of money. Um, I've got a client who was able to convince their QSA that their call center PCs were out of scope because they only handle one card number at a time. That, that My question, <laughs> sure. My question is, in the experience of the QSAs or ex-QSAs in the room, are the folks handling the PCI compliance programs now still security folks? Because what I'm seeing is they're no. folks from the business, they're folks from an op maybe a business ops background, but they're not security folks. Who's, you know, who's writing the checks? It's a mix. It I'll, I'll throw out yeah. the first comment. It, it's a mix. So I, I, see, I see organizations. I'm an ex-QSA. Don't hold it against me. <laughs> don't, don't you even start over there, Mr. Angry Birds. <laughs> Um, you know, and, and I got a few others in this room. Yeah, you know, she who's laughing in the front. Uh huh. 
Um, but we all we all have blood on our hands. Right, right, right. But but it, 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 it's totally dependent on company. I mean, you know, some places it's internal audit. Some places it's it's you know just the security team. Some places it's random smatterings of IT. I think that's totally a subjective thing. And 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 sometimes it's a dedicated department. Yeah, it's, could, this is the exactly. PCI compliance department in those yep. fifty thousand person organizations. Agreed. Cool. So uh, any disagreements? Quick quick reminder: if you're here for the five o'clock talk, you're Shit out of luck. What he said. <laughs> they didn't show. That, that one didn't show. And so uh, because PCI is so damn sexy, uh, we're going to con continue with the next question, sir. Right. So um, you were talking about debit cards being a great solution, but yeah. maybe can you, can you expand upon why it is and, and give a little more detail behind it? Because my understanding of debit cards, at least in the United States, you know, that's tied to my bank account. And if it you're, gets you're stolen, doing it wrong. I'm screwed. All my thousands of dollars are in that, that, yeah, are in that you're account doing it wrong. are gone. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny. There's lots of good examples around the world of debit card implementations that work. The way the United States is doing debit card implementation is by trying to tag it onto the credit it's, card system. It's right. You silly Canadian. If the United States is doing it, it's the right way. Right. So anyways... <laughs> We, we, we've got this other system called Interac, and you're absolutely right, it's tied to your bank account, but what you've inherited in a negative way from the cards is you've inherited their risk model that says, if you get violated, it's all your fault. The real way, yeah, it's, it's, looking, it's, it's nice to happier, be touched actually, while right being now. violated. No, he's happy now, um, Jack. The, the way that we do it instead is we say, you know what, if, if that card is compromised, sure, the money's gonna pop out of your bank account, but it's gonna pop right in the next day, or you know, at, at the least that same day, because the, the system, I mean, shit, I got my first debit card when I was like seven or eight years old. Um, it's been insituated for so long that, you know, Canadians are out of the habit of carrying cash. We don't do checks like the United States does. I don't think anybody does checks like the United States does. Um, so we've got the system that is a fixed transaction cost. It's always the same. It's like six cents per transaction. Um, for, for the merchants that utilizes the same sort of, you know, chip and pin terminals that you're accustomed to. Um, it does have that tie back to your bank account. So it's not a credit system. It's a very definitely a debit system, but it's not tied to the brands. It's not part of that ecosystem. It's not using that processing hardware. It's not using this ridiculous bullshit where your credit limit is updated by the second, but you may or may not find out what the transaction was for three or four days. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a different system. It's a real-time system that's designed to be real-time from scratch. Um, oh, yeah, the, sorry, the, 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 the statement is, the big thing is that there be protections on the account, and that doesn't exist here, because you're piggybacking it on a system that is broken by design. Um, and so you're inheriting all that brokenness, only instead of it being with fake money that you haven't paid for yet, it's with real money that you thought you had. Hey, did Sorry. you see that sign in the back that said Tim Horton sucks? Look over there. Next question. Next question. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, so I think a lot of what you guys have been talking about right, is actually. pretty applicable. Um, I think what a lot of people in this room are thinking of is level one and level two merchants. When they think about all the PCI controls. Um, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, the usefulness of the self-assessment questionnaire and whether or not level three and level four merchants should even be allowed do, to do, handle credit cards outside do, of do, a, do you know what? Back away from the microphone. Do you know what? On 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 the and any time you ask me how much I weigh, I'm going to give you the best answer possible. That <laughs> shit that comes up on the scale is I am so not drunk. Yeah, Self-assessment. I, I can lie to you as well as your QSA. So, any thoughts on how to solve how, how to solve that issue? Because well, Just all, like my grade four, four teacher. Tran transparent. No. Well, that and transparency, right? Yeah. Let's see numbers on breaches and self-assessment. Yeah. And, and actually, I, I think Mr. Arlen actually said it well before, the, the concept of random audits. Yeah. I, I don't care if you do your own SAQ or, or whatever it is. I mean, however you answer the questions is fine, but somebody at some point is going to show up unannounced and check whether or not you're full of shit. I think that's the right answer, honestly. Yeah. You know, uh, n not planning it and having everybody going, look at our controls, right? I mean, that doesn't work well. So, so Mike Don, who fought me on this, right? He, PCI was awesome, right? Wait a minute, Mike he, Don fought you on something? Shush, shush, shush. So he <laughs> just, Arm wrestling. He's got a really great blog post on this. So he's at Cha Chaotic Mind, I think is what the blog is called. Yep. And he talks about not, not the self-assessment is a bad thing, 
but as a great thing, like as a way to possibly completely avoid this. It's like Sock's self-attestation without the jail time. And his point was, if you actually care about security and it is getting in your way, you should self-assess because then you can redirect, redirect the time and budget to more important things. Because we're, one of the assumptions in the self-assessment is they might cheat the system that doesn't really work anyhow. Like, in some cases, like, so what? They passed, they failed, they didn't, they didn't. All that really matters is failures. So instead of, like, re regulating a hypothesis of controls that might stop it, you know, penalize people when they fail. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying completely get rid of the thing, but he saw that if, it, in fact, you determine in your risk assessment it's hurting you more than it's helping you, he's encouraging you to do the self-assessment. Well, I, I'm just thinking if you, if you add up all the money that the banks spend, or the, you know, the processing, collecting these SAQs, dealing with them, and then you, t you think about all the fraud that occurs and how much that costs, would it be cheaper for the banks just to give them end-to-end -end encryption? And be or, done or, with or tokenization to yeah. eliminate scope. But, or but the, sy it. the system doesn't support that. Remember, we're talking about something that was designed 50 years ago. It's not built to do that sort of thing, which is why, you know, pulling up that example, go and have a look at how Interact works. It, it's completely different. It's what we use for interbranch stuff, like when I take my bank card and shove it in a different branch or a different bank's. ABMs, that's how it works. It's the same thing that I run through the, the card reader at, at the grocery store. It's a different system with a different set of constraints, with a different set of design criteria than something that's going to work in Azerbaijan to make sure that your taxi driver gets paid. And you find out whether or not that payment cleared instantly, as far as your credit limit is concerned, and three or four days later when eventually they get around to telling you what your transactions were. It's yeah. just that the system itself is fundamentally flawed. So, so let's um, grab the next question. But just because you mentioned uh, end, -end, end to end encryption, which solves all of our problems, um, <laughs> I just wanted to bring this this slide up that uh, Alex might actually just chuckled, and that's all I needed. To, um, th that made my point. Uh, last year, 90%. This year, 89% of those folks uh, that made that found themselves on the Verizon data breach investigations report, uh, they got the encryption bit right. Uh, so the people in this room that have been saying encryption doesn't solve all your problems, and maybe some of the people that have been saying stuff like encryption is sexy because it keeps the attacker from getting discovered, uh, may have a point. And you have a point. A couple, actually. One, I agree with you, uh, a CISP does not make a good QSA. In fact, oftentimes it's the opposite. A good auditor actually has to have years and years of experience and actually know what the hell they're doing. It pisses me off to go in and actually clean up or audit somebody and say, hey, uh, your auditor totally got it wrong last year and you've got a lot of work to do. So, But I think the other part of it, talking about uh, self-assessments, is it's a good opportunity for security or IT staff to bring in processes and procedures to get trained, because half of the IT staff out there doesn't know security either. What do you think on that? So are you saying that the self-assessment is a good chance to trick your organization into training your people? Uh, I think it's a good way, if the C-level is <laughs> open to it, to actually bring in some help. So. I can see that. Yeah. If there's no other way. I mean, seriously, I mean, if, you're, if your organization doesn't give a crap about training your people or, and, and you know, they're like, well, you'll just figure it out in the audit. Yeah, but that's the, that's the target demographic for PCI's intended. Well, but, but think about it, though. There's, there's training and then there's training. You know, sitting there for an hour in front of a horrifying PowerPoint presentation that's been shoved into Adobe Captivate doesn't turn my frickin' <laughs> crank. I'm not going to learn from just that because yourself, it's not real. Whatever. There's, it's awesome. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. The, you learn it. We, but I, 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 I think I, where, where C-levels won't listen to their uh, IT staff, but they'll listen to the QSA that comes in and makes the recommendations to secure their systems. Yep. Anybody written a QSA so, yeah, test? Don't re How remember that big that graphic? Shit? I mean, no one's stealing credit card data anymore anyhow because the street price dropped to nearly worthless. So we sucked so bad that we don't have to get attacked anymore. It's I can't talk about card. breaches that I may or may not know about, but, yeah, not so much this year. I was being sarcastic. Next. Next. Oh, wow. Hello. It's hard to tell when you are. Hi. Right. Bef before we hear your awesome commentary, oh. which I am looking forward to, I, um, if you're here for, oh. say, the 5 o'clock talk or the 5.20 talk, um, neither of those are going to be in here. So instead of wandering down to the Q&A room, 
Um, we will continue this here because this is kind of interesting, and I know it's nowhere near as sexy as uh, some things, although this really uh, does hammer the crap out of us. But please forgive any member of this panel who runs out cross-legged because they have to pee because people made us drink beer. Uh, that said, you are going to provide an, an amazing question and or comment for us, so please do. I have, I have two points I, I wanted to bring Sorry. up for discussion. Um, one is I just went through PCI Level 1, uh, the audit part. We're working on our rock right now, so this is pretty topical for me. Um, and the first thing is, is I'm designing my, I've got my list of compliance activities. I'm trying to map them to my controls. And we're a two-person security team, so I'm the junior. This is my problem. Um, how do I, what of the, you know, general compliance activities should I really be focusing on to do real security instead of bullshit paperwork? Because um, I really don't want to do that, and I know I have to do a certain percentage of it, but really what do you guys feel as QSAs or as experienced persons would bring the most value to an organization? Uh, so you're a retailer? Um, we are a phone company. Phone we're, company? We're an IVR company. Okay. So you, do you have point of sale or no? No. We, 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 we process IVR calls, so, so it passes through. We don't ever store. Yeah. Okay. I think any answer without yeah. us knowing your environment would be a, a, a flippant really answer. In, in general, though, we, we did a mapping of security controls to efficacy. Like okay. the, I call them PCI's chosen few. And uh, the efficacy of many of them are in the toilet. Um, but one thing I will say is, um, in general, right now, for, the, for attackers beyond just casual ones, anything that gives you more visibility, you know, see things sooner, prompt an agile response, anything that fuels an OODA loop of observe, orient, decide, act, this is kind of the visible ops mantra I, I referred to earlier. Um, the parts, it, it's, fun, it's funny and sad. Log management is a requirement, and yet zero breaches were detected via using log management. It's not that you can't do it, it's that no one's looking at them. Right. So if you, if you just do a log management program to tick a box, it's fairly low, low value. If you use it to help improve your eyes and ears, it can be fairly high value. Um, so I, you have to do them all anyhow. The question of which ones are gonna be the most useful as well for other things, it, to me, it's more eyes and ears to inform your incident response cycle. If you want some evidence-based approach, this is from our study, um, and it shows you threat actions. So we can't describe your particular threat landscape to you, but we can say in general, here are large likelihood threat actions. Now, map that to ver various controls. There's also uh, a report by Trustwave. If you're in Europe, 7Safe uh, in the UK has issued a report. But these are also great places to go and look for data. Um, and so. What I'm basically asked, telling you is, what you do is you do real evidence-based risk management. Well, I, I, well let, me, let me throw in one thing real quick. Yeah. Just, just real quick. I, I was just gonna say, I, I don't think there's anything in PCI that's just complete BS. Seriously, I mean, there's variations, there's ways to do it and so forth, but I mean, you look through your 12 areas, you gotta have policy, you gotta have some encryption, you gotta have firewalls. I mean, whether or not it's the exact language and the exact implementation, and I mean, I'm not going to get into that. It's a semantic debate, but that is a baseline. If, if you don't have any of those things to begin with, you've already got a problem. Checking the boxes and then going, okay, now what really gets us to the point of security is probably the best approach. But if you've got massive gaps, if you know you have no IDS, if you know you don't have any sort of code review or QA process, if you know you don't have any monitoring capabilities, as Josh just said, you've already got yeah. issues, right? So, I mean, go ahead and use it as a starting point, right? Yeah, well, but, but hang on. We've got this weird kind of problem. Are you trying to be compliant or are you trying to be secure? See, I have to she do compliance to, do both. to get my budget. Both. Right. I have to do compliance to make my mm. CEO happy. So, I have to do compliance to get everyone to listen to me. So what, but I so, want to be secure. So my natural advice to you is do InfoSec right. Go, go through all of those basics. I mean, just, just take the dirty dozen alone and just run them down and do them right. Because if you're doing them even vaguely correctly and you've got a QSA that doesn't have their head crammed firmly up their ass, you're going to get through. That's sort of step one. Step two says if you want to be really pedantic about it, you be specifically compliant with each and every and only requirements. So you run down that list of, what is it, 200, I'm not a QSA, 280 something? 256? Yep. Whatever. Run down that list and make sure that you've got a chunk of evidence that you can set down right next to it and say, all right, here's the requirement, 
here's the response, here's the requirement, here's the response, and just run down the list. Then, regardless of how pedantic your QSA is, you've got all of the answers sitting there in front of you. If you do the second way, you're probably not going to be any more measurably secure than you are today. You're just more measurably compliant. Um, but you know, th this is my usual rant, and I'm sorry that it's my usual rant, and everyone's all heard it before, but if we just do even, you know, who wants to live in a minimum code standard house, really? I'd like my house to not be made out of bubble gum and chewing crap and things that some guy who was paid by the house to do the tile work, you know, like, just do it right. Um, look at it, look at, look at the organization, look at the, the InfoSec part of it lead in as, you, as something that you have ownership in, that you have pride in, and do the fucking job right. So, Alex had to pee really bad, so I'm going to make his point, and I should have made it earlier. Um, the attack density is, how, is the language he uses, but the attack density you'll see from the Spider Labs reports are here. They're, they're really useful because a couple concrete pieces of advice we tend to give. Um, everybody thinks you should patch faster because you want to measure the mean time to patch, and yet their data showed that zero of the breaches last year involved a patchable vulnerability. So we were putting a lot of energy into something that wasn't attacked or exploited very often. Conversely, look at number two there, which is SQL injection. A lot of people try to pass specifically 6.6 .6, um, with, uh, with, with the honor statements. With yeah, the prepared statements, the honor system of the SDLC. And I think an SDLC is good, but you should try to, you know, social engineer your budget into, you know, maybe we shouldn't skip the, the WAF. You know, I'm not saying a WAF fixes everything, but this is an example of lots of attack there. Right. And we cut a corner, right? So if you look at where the most failures have happened, it may better aim just, how you are you stretch the limits of the interpretation. Where did, where did Alex go? I just oh, to ask you know, one real men can hold their urine, but I guess Alex couldn't. No. You're, you're um, here, here's the I other know. really cool, no awesome, kidding. important thing. Um, um, the You've got all of our things I say are usually on purpose. Twitters, and you can find us all because we're findable on the on the there, internets. We're in the Googles. Um, you can ask questions. Like seriously, you know, I, I probably spend upwards of two hours a week just answering weird crap that lands in my inbox. So feel I think free we're to actually ask. Actually connected in some way, shape, or form on LinkedIn. That's so. kind of freaky. So it's kind of yeah. weird, actually. We, yeah, we no, do have yeah. a couple more people that have comments yeah. and questions. Um, I just wanted to ask one last thing, and then I'm okay. Not, um, my QSA when he came in to do our on-site audit mentioned that in PCI DSS 2.0, the auditor's requirements were significantly larger in terms of evidence collection. Can you speak briefly to what, it, what I can expect <laughs> in terms of impact on here? me, in terms of evidence providing, or like really, how much is it gonna change things for us? <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm not a QSA. Ask around though, there's one in the front row. There you go, offline. Uh, Ooh, she's good to know, the, too. The, the significance oh, crap, there. Alex is back. Shit. So, wait, Alex is up there. Just because I have the opportunity and um, I... First of all, I have to make a disclaimer. I have a cool new job, I think I said that, and compliance is a big part of the company that I work for. Uh, that's not where it started. But compliance does give us jobs, but it, we're here... People that are at this event are here because we um, like to break shit, we like to fix stuff. And uh, sometimes there's a little, uh, a little disconnect there. But uh, we have a couple more questions. One of the things that uh, we would really like to talk about is that um, there are some really uncomfortable, if you dig in, incestuous relationships between uh, certain people that might, for example, be on the PCI Council and certain corporations. And uh, there's some information out there that even here, because some of us like things like paychecks, we kind of tap dance around, and with any luck, um, we can, next year, uh, we'll have made enough money that we don't need a job anymore, or whatever, and can do that. But if you don't think that, um, that incestuous relationships are part of the reason that things are stacked up the way they are, it's interesting. With that said, I'm going to shut up as long as I can. Is that can. like a conspiracy theory that you were kind of throwing out there? Well, so, I mean, next it, question. So, next how, question. How many planes have flown into the Pentagon? No, wait, that's a different. That's wow. Question. Different right. Question, right. please, because they're like intelligent people next Shut to me and up. lined up in front of the microphone, but not behind me. <laughs> You're this so microphone. wearing a turban, dude. It's All right. not a turban, you fucking dumb American. Okay. Question. I don't remember what I it's just, called, I just, though. I just got a question related to scoping. Um, if, if scoping? 
tier two, tier three, you know, it depends on the amount of uh, cards you're processing. If you're a multinational corporation, you're going through many different gateways. Like say you have 500,000 in the US and you got 400,000 in Canada and another 200,000 in uh, Europe. You're over a million at that point, but they're all going through different gateways and you know, they're different um, subsidiary companies. They're all tied to one parent. How does PCI scope that? Is, would you be a tier two? Would you be a tier three? Magic. There's a scoping SIG, which stands for Special Interest Group, and they are in just a big old circle right now, to the point where, to the, to the point what? where several of them are trying to quit. Well, okay, so, so the 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 scoping SIG initiative that started a long time ago, maybe it's closed now. Um, was fighting over things like, oh, if we share a DNS, doesn't that make everything else that touches the DNS touch everything else? So that's just going kind of nowhere right now. Right. So I would ask your QSA, because really, at the end of the day, it's the interpretation of the person who does the rock. Okay. You do know that this whole thing is opinion-based on your QSA's part. Right. And yeah. no right. one's ever bought an auditor off. Uh, Arthur he, Anderson. He, <laughs> he, he, and, and again, bottom yeah. line, if you get an incident, there's no way you're going to be like, oh, yeah, they were compliant, but they had an incident. You That's know, just not Jack happen. didn't make one of his best points that I think is his best points. He says, you know, you should interview your QSA, because if you have to do this thing, you might as well make some good use out of it. Right. So, you know, Yeah, find a risk-based QSA. Somebody, if one, if seriously, you, if you, QSA you want somebody who's cheap risk. and fly by night, you can get that. And if you want someone who's going to actually help you, you can it, get that too. That, that would well, be a QSA who's doing their job correctly. Yeah, well, the, the, there are QSAs that, that care. Um, I do want to back up a little bit about uh, something I said about the council. There, there are people that actually care about security that are involved with PCI. Um, I can think of one who was recently elected <laughs> to something or another. Um, and he, he's he's an awesome guy and has a big green egg and makes great smoked meats. Uh, but <laughs> but there's, there are other people who care, but it's just such a polluted um, situation. What the, there were like five angry birds and a pig. Martin stole them, Martin stole them all, actually. Martin had no, I'm, children. No, doing a bum rush. Everybody who needs to, um, or who wants to go hear Martin do his network security podcast, if you would just kind of like jump on him and right. seize our angry birds back, would be and really appreciated. Completely shifting gears for just about 15 two seconds. More, two more guys. And we're going to get to these guys, but just in case you're not aware of this, if you think I'm wearing this clothing for a political statement, you're, not, you're wrong. It's just because I was in Dubai and it's kind of cool and comfortable. Uh, but if you think I'm doing it to uh, make fun of Middle Eastern culture, you're even more wrong. Uh, and I will say this, that as I said in the fail panel, if you get your news about the Middle East from Western media sources, Durka, you Durka, Durka. fail. Um, and that said, let's talk about PCI because there are two intelligent and articulate people who have uh, stood up in front of the microphone, and the first of them has this to say. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that though PCI is a security policy, is a security guideline, it's definitely not the best one out there by far. For the vast majority of us, type three and four, is it fair to say with limited funds, pick another better security thing to go by? Pick the SANS top 20, for example, to Dave I'm talking to pretty much. Um, do the bare minimum to make PCI happy and then spend your money actually solving security. Is that a fair thing to take away from this? Yeah, well, in, in, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 go ahead. In, in our report, and one of the things that the data allowed us to do was say, okay, yeah, you know what? Here are basic, for the first time in the, in, in the industry, really best practices supported by data, right? So here are a handful of things that you can do. And again, it's not just the Verizon report, there's a trust rate report and, and so forth. So I would go seek the data versus seek yet another standard. The SANS thing is great, right? It's expert but, opinion, blah, blah, but, blah. But remember though, you need to be meta compliant with a number of standards simultaneously. Whatever your org is, you've got PCI plus something else, plus something else, plus something else, plus something else. And that Venn diagram is your unique and special snowflake. Sure. You need he to was talking three and four, and I was overgeneralizing about the simplicity of their Venn diagram. You, yeah. you overgeneralized? And, and for the no, three and fours, I, it's much better. It's often better to, to if outsource it, a if lot it's of that. Well, it, lie through your teeth. So through he, your here's, here's what I've seen it's as a QSA so. and just as a like, generic security guy in a lot of capacities. Um, and, and feel free to disagree with me because I'm in, you know, elbow range for a couple of you guys. Um, but I prefer more prescriptive, technical, tactical standards. 
Um, like I, especially as a level three, four, I wouldn't say, you know, go latch on to ISO 27,000 as a reasonable approach to getting your shit together. I'd say, you know what? PCI is pretty good actually for you or, or the SANS top 20 would be pretty good for you. Something that says, hey, it'd be really freaking awesome if you had an IDS and here's some examples of things that work. <laughs> or, you know, hey, guess what? You know, network-based access controls are okay and you should have some. Like those are, are reasonable things to kind of go around. Um, but, you know, I think I could, we could probably have a series of jokes in this room on, you know, what is quote unquote best practices. Uh, there is no such thing. Hello. I, I right. figured I mean, it out. It's, it's, totally, yeah, it's, it's, it's common practice. It's subjective, right? Uh, no, what, it's, it's common. If the other guy's doing it, then that's what I'll do. I won't do what's best because that costs an extra 2%, and I'm not willing to spend that 2% because the other guy's not doing it. You know, you're in a situation where people are saying, well, you know, if, if, if Citibank's not doing it, why, why, why should I do it? True, but I think we all saw the metrics from Alex where only 19% are doing it right. Ouch. Or per PCI, so maybe that's wrong. Yeah. So but, I'm seeing a but lot of your, your, your organization may be that unique and special snowflake that does need to take into consideration shit like 27,001 or 27,005. Agreed. You missed it. I thought you went into a seizure whenever I said 27,005. Come on, do the dance. Come on. You know it. You love it. <gasps> Our, yes. Last one. paragraph. Question. All right. Uh, so I've had kind of the opportunity to have worked in different spectrums, uh, doing the pen testing, working with a consulting firm. You, you need to fillet these microphones to be heard? Yeah, yeah, could you get it? Yeah, a little, thank you. It, it is and tough to hear it up also here. also kind of short. So, um, so I've had the opportunity to work in a lot of different atmospheres. So I, I worked with a consulting firm where we hired really gray hair consultants and did a lot of really good stuff. Uh, we did the uh, PCI consulting. Uh, so we, we tried to do it the right way. Um, and, and I've been on the card side and understand the merchant side. And so I've had a lot of different experiences. I guess my question to you guys is, we talk about the infrastructure is screwed, and I don't disagree, it's kind of screwed. But the credit card companies and various other entities have come up with technologies, such as near field, right, to be able to do no card number, to be able to do different ways of not presenting uh, the same way we do today. But the problem is it's a global scale problem. And so I guess my question is, do you have, even from a straw man perspective, uh, what you think would be the solution, knowing that it's not the cards, it's not the merchants, it's not the processors, watch, it's not the watch networks, this panel, it's everything. Watch the recording of this panel from last year. I spent 10 minutes describing how to fix the problem. It would take less than two years to convert 99 plus percent by using economic incentives and disincentives to solve the problem. So, so that's, that's what I'm wondering. So yep. is the proposition that it requires government intervention? And, and I think partially um, it does. Uh, I, I think, um, I think the, the only way Canada Well, no, no, no the, the, government, the government right? intervention isn't actually government intervention. It's weird. What we need to do is redefine usury, not as a fixed percentage, but as a spread against the overnight rate. Once we do that, the problem will be a self-hammering nail. You'll set it down on the desk, and it'll just go thunk. Right and, and remember, yeah, and this I, is in response I to mean, government un intervention. Unfortunately, though, you're dealing with uh, greed across an entire spectrum of industries, not just banking, not just merchant, but across the entire spectrum of in industries. Yeah. So when I was doing PCI assessments, um, we, we couldn't get the merchants to actually allow us to do the right thing. Period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so it, it isn't just one industry or other. I mean, but, it's but a global perspective. But there's no so. economic incentive, right? You got, yeah. Right. This, this goes back to that whole does everybody speed question that, that somebody talked about. Um, the economic incentive isn't there for me to stop speeding. If they fixed it Agreed. so that if you do 56 miles an hour in the United States, the fine is $1 million, lose your car, lose your license for the rest of your life, right. nobody's going to speed. It's that's, like the Warren Buffett well, quote I know how to get a balanced budget. Right? The way you get yeah. a balanced budget in the U.S. is you make a law that says, hey, if you don't pass a balanced budget, you're not up for re-election. Again, we're dealing with so, government intervention, so you're dealing but, with contracting but, lobbyists and everything No, else. but the economic incentive disincentive model is so simple. And I think part of the reason that we have trouble with it is because we like complicated shit. Um, the, it's very simple. You just say, you know what, if you want to use the old system, that's fine. We leave all of the rates in place the way they are now, or maybe we jack them up a little bit for both consumer, card processor, and merchant, and issuing bank, and everybody. And then we issue a new system that is unconnected to the old system. 
It does not use credit card numbers. The credit card doesn't even look like a credit card anymore. Whatever the hell we do, we do something else, something new. Maybe it's one-time pads because you know we can store several billion of those on a card now. Right. Whatever it is, and you make it very simple. It has a new fee structure. The new fee structure is dead easy. It's fixed price per transaction. It's cheaper by orders of magnitude, and you fix the risk to put the risk right where it fucking belongs, well, and, which and is back the on the cards. Thing, right? You're so just describing separate, one. A separate entire well, global infrastructure outside of Interconnect yeah. and everything. Well, absolutely. And that's just, and that's well, that's just one solution. There are multiple solutions, right? We could keep the same broken infrastructure and yeah. start implementing risk pooling. There's a million different ways to do it, but unfortunately, we acted like security is an engineering problem. So what did we do? We came up with a bunch of engineering answers to a non-engineering problem. I mean, we, we had a lot of debates agree. last year on, on his particular solution, but the part I like about his solution is um, you can incentivize anything. What we do is we have to make it really expensive to do it a fucked up way. Yeah. So, so quit with the it. backward compatibility. Why do we have raised numbers on the fucking cards anymore? How many people have used a shik shik machine lately? I, this yeah. year. Yeah. Right? right, and, and you know what? Merchants. Probably, probably well, in the, the point. A lot of merchants still do. So you're probably not in the with riskiest with environments, the though. Yeah? So you okay. disincentive that. You say, you know what? Yeah, we're going to put in two systems, and watch how quickly that old system withers and dies. It'll stick around for 40 years. You'll still find it in weird, freaking corners of society. I, I guess but you my know what? Point is, Everybody will be using the one system, the good ooh. one. Who disincentivizes it? I mean, because well, it, you're not going to get the card the brands. The, the, the card no brands way. or the processors. The card, I mean, the card brands are are just they're not incentivized to disincentivize it because sure they they're are. not the ones losing the money. The merchants are. If no, and and one of the things that absolutely one of the things no. that comes up is <laughs> why would yeah. they why would they provide a discount? Dance and we off. have to talk about the card brands. They're not going to provide a discount. They're going to charge a penalty. Let's, it's greed. It's about greed. Greed is good. It's Absolute, capitalist that's, society. That's, that's uh, what I'm saying. But, you it know, I mean, it's like good. if you boil it down a square, a dongle that you could jam into your iPod or Android, what could possibly yeah. go wrong with that? Um, they charge more for card not present. I mean, that's a simple but, thing that we accept now. But um, can, we, can we grab one more question? You, you, you lose, this is, you this has gone on so back. long, I'm almost sober, so we need yeah. to... <laughs> but remember, though, right, the, yeah. the, the cards do have an incentive. They want to be the currency. That's Absolutely. their incentive. Absolutely. And to get to that incentive, they need to convert more people to using cards. They need to convince the United States to stop moving little tiny slips of paper around and calling that money. And you know what? It's not going to be that hard to do if you make it so that when you walk into the store, they don't hand you one price for cash and one price for credit. You know, you drive by every gas station on the goddamn interstate, there's two different gas prices. Make that shit go away, and it'll go away fast. Yeah, so I mean, fast like that people can't look at it rationally. And, and I hate to be that foreign asshole, but God, people, stop watching Fox News and CNN and look at your own world from the outside. Because no, 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 this country is functionally insane. We're, we're, and you're all okay with it. And you, you need you to still look have at to, it. If you're going to have lenders... We'll say lenders, credit card companies, yes. and lenders. Mm. Then they have to somehow make mm. money off of those transactions. And look, I, I'm not trying to advocate one way or the other. I'm just saying yeah. the reason those gas stations are doing that is because they pay a fee for yeah. people to be able to take their cards and whatnot. Well, so that's why they're doing it. How could you possibly take away the ability for the companies who are making those loans to make that money? That's that's and how are you going to detach there's, there's that? There's more. There's more money in fixed transaction cost and high transaction volume than there is but in it's still a cost. That's my then, point. Then it's there still is a in, cost other than cash. Then there is in percentage against unbelievable amounts of fraud risk. Yeah. And I, you know I, what? Yeah. There, there's a cost in handling cash and most people don't realize this. If you're no, if you're working in org let, and you're yeah. handling dollar bills, you're losing money every right. fucking day because dollar bills are sticky. Let, let's and they smell yeah. Grab bad. one more. Thank you very much. We're, Get coins. We're easy to find. We're all like media whores or whatever the <laughs> hell. What, all right. So I'm a media whore, and I'll find anybody that you can't find on this panel, but you can find them. You, sir, look intelligent and articulate and sexy. I said almost sober. Uh, so one of the topics you only uh, sort of touched on Filate the uh, microphone. We was, can't the, hear you. was the chosen few. Uh, and um, so as someone who was a security vendor for years and now does consulting work for security vendors, there's clearly a subset of technologies, depending on the account, what, 11 or so that are acquired by PCI. And by my count, I think Gartner covered 160 subcategories of security. I'd love to hear your guys' thoughts on where um, 
where those other 149 security categories are going to be over the next couple of years since PCI 2.0 is where it is for, uh, for three more exciting years. Um, so what, what, for the other, uh, all the folks here focused on innovation, where do you see, uh, how does this impact them over the next few years? So since I wrote that article on the chosen few, I will take a first stab. But um, the assumption we make is that those 11 things are the best 11 things out of the 189 that he said. And by my assessment on perceived efficacy or NSS test labs efficacy, they're some of our worst ones. So every time you're picking and funding a, an inferior technology from the dinosaur age over something that is better, it's a mistake. And it's a mistake forced by the compliance stuff. Now, I also don't think on the other side, I'm not advocating that everything new and shiny and blinky is better. Um, some of those things should just go the hell away. By my count, out of those 158 or so, you know, there's probably 30 total that are usually good if you do the cross-section of the things that people need to do. Um, but we haven't done a, a, a separated the wheat from the chaff to look at of these things against modern attacks in virtual environments, cloud environments, outsourced cloud service provider environments with lulsec type adversaries or APT kitten killing type adversaries. We haven't done a vetting process. We're just taking something that a bunch of people thought was a good idea in 2003 and saying it's still a good idea now. Um, what I did see when I was an analyst covering all these new innovators is they weren't getting any spending. So really good shit. Couldn't get spent. And I went to the CISOs. I said, why aren't you buying that? You know you need it. You know it would help your specific problem. And they said, well, I took it to the CIO and they said, if we won't get fined, you don't get budget. So if it was on the chosen few, it got spending, and if it wasn't, it didn't. Now, some people had a little extra budget. They could buy one thing that wasn't on the chosen few. But I, I saw that as a pretty big um, economic disincentive, and that's why most of these vendors steered away from stop stopping or solving new problems, and they started to look very, very similar to the PCI list. And, and when you think about it, though, we've been burying technologies for that entire decade. You know, once upon a time in a galaxy far, far away in a former life, um, in 2003, I worked on a thing that smelled a lot like a web application firewall, XML firewall, that is better today than anything else you can buy today. And it's been sitting on a shelf since 2005 because it was deemed not marketable. And it's still better than anything you can buy today. I mean, it, it just it absolutely boggles the mind. And that's one example of God only knows how many technologies were buried because they weren't deemed to be commercially option. And, and we keep doing that. We keep saying, you know, the, the vendors come back and they say, well, nobody's asking for that feature. And they give us some other raging featureitis shit they've come up with, or they subdivide something and say, this is two different products, you know, like antivirus and anti-malware, because somehow foreign code that doesn't belong in my system running on my system is not the same thing. You know, it, every time that happens, we're, 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 we're killing little bunnies, and that's not cool. But there's also no way around it, and, and my biggest well, not my biggest frustration. You don't want that list. Holy shit. Um, my, my current frustration with, with the PCI Council is moving to the three-year standard in an effort to appease people who said, oh, my God, it's moving too fast. Uh, 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 we, we don't get the innovation that's necessary to go against the fact that our attackers are innovating at a speed that we couldn't keep up with before. So we, yeah. we, we've got a guaranteed arms race loss. We're busy fighting a land war in Europe. Um, when, and we have data that shows that the threat landscape has changed and is changing and will rapidly change and yeah. it will change again. Given that PCI has stated they want to see uh, things that are best practice, are any of these things best practice? All right. That, f by the way, that's a lie. I know where you're going. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to have to say this quickly because they don't want you to know this. But the uh, so the question was, what, at which point of adoption and popularity does it qualify to be added as the, the, the 12th or 13th requirement? Um, and essentially, you might recall when they testified in front of Congress, there were some accusations that perhaps PCI was market manipulating. Because if you look at the WAF market before 6.6 .6 and the WAF market after 6.6, .6, 
it was market manipulation. So they are terrified. They're not going to say this publicly, but they are terrified of ever being accused of being market manipulators again. And that's why there wasn't a single, that's one of the reasons there wasn't a single new technology requirement. Even though there were lobbyists from the end-to-end -end encryption, lobbyists from the tokenization, lobbyists from data loss prevention, all three camps thought they were going to be added and they were shut out. So don't wait for the next three year cycle for them to be added. They're not going to be added then either. Because as soon as they market manipulate, then they're going to get more Fed involved. Is that a seven? Go ahead. So next question. Kind of switching gears. We've been talking a lot about the defensive. And hey, we've talked to you before. I know. It oh. came up. I, I couldn't get enough. Um, Alex, <laughs> I was wondering what, uh, you know, since you, you, know, you worked with USSS on the, the breach report, what have our, what are, I mean, are we playing any offense that's, that's making a difference? Have you seen increase in our offensive capabilities over the past few years? Or are we just letting people from Eastern Europe come and take our, our goodies and run? Go. Uh, you know, I, I can't, I, we, we can't derive motivation directly from the data. Um, what I will tell you is this, uh, that there is a huge change in tactics. It wasn't, you saw the, the 140 breaches and then the uh, jump to 761. It wasn't like Verizon, the Secret Service, you know, went four times, you know, had four times the incident responders, right? It wasn't like we created the, the demand. The demand came to us, okay? So that, that was a significant change um, in, in that regard. I have no idea what Jack's trying to show you other than... I'm, I'm, it's a lot of incredible I'm pictures I that have, are really incredible. But, but oh my gosh, that was an awesome one. No, just stop right there. But, but the point, attendees. to answer your, to, to kind of answer your question, um, I don't, I haven't seen offense, um, and I don't know if that's a function because there isn't any, or I don't know if that's because that there's a function that it wasn't necessary. I'll, this, I'll, I'll, I'll throw something out there, wait, actually. Wait. I, this, I can't, I can't get This you... random gentleman with no knowledge whatsoever of our industry is going to make an amazing comment. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. I thought Jack said he was so I, well, I, I was just, before, before I, that I, comment, I, I'll just say yes, offensive yes. But, but, shut up oh, and listen, okay. dude, shut up and listen. Um, I love you too, Jack. I'm familiar with a, with a number of the processors and the acquirers, and I understand that some of them have taken the responsibility to administer the self-assessment questionnaires to their own merchants, but I'm also familiar with the fact that one of them went to the council and said, we'd like to do the scans on our own merchants as well. What's your take on that, guys? Boy, Qualls is going to be pissed when that happens. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Are, are, are we right back at that point where 100,000 merchants are going to be able to solve a problem that three card brands can't? It, it, it starts to sound like we're trying to put the fix in the wrong place. And, and we're, going to end, we're going to end up with a, with a beautiful roof for a house that was supposed to be a gas station. Is the fox watching the hen house? Didn't you hear me talk about the whole Rico thing? If you're going to supply me with a problem and you're the only one who can supply me with a solution, we've got words for that. It's called Rico. Let's use it. I mean, it was supposed to be used on mobsters, but uh, credit card companies will cheerfully throw your ass in a pair of concrete overshoes if you forget to pay them. Uh, yes, even in Canada. Although, although there at least the, um, the, the health care around the drowning is, is you know, covered. <laughs> So I'm just randomly clicking through things in my past life here. This is kind of entertaining. Why Can you, you click us some more beers up here? Why Seriously, are you people be useful. Here? I mean, oh, actually, we have a question. There's Hello. a great story there, but there's someone here. Who knows okay. that story? Quick, besides so Michelle. I've heard from you guys that there is a system that works and the transparency will help us get us there, and incentivization is part of the key of that. Mm -hmm. How do we incentivize the people to get their transparency so they realize they ought to switch the system to make more money? You get a bunch of drunk guys up on a panel and you have them <laughs> whine about it, apparently. Uh, the, That's Jack's solution. The, the, the real answer is that there's, there's no desire to switch the system right now because they're making enough money despite the loss that it doesn't matter and they're getting away with pushing the liability for the flawed system down on other people's heads. You, you get know. LulzSec to attack they, they, Bob Russo. <laughs> Sorry, what? Or you could just get LulzSec to attack Bob Russo. Yeah, sure. I was Man. kidding. That was not a suggestion. Uh -huh. are, are you yeah. one of them? I cannot believe you said that out loud. It's not a suggestion. I think we're being kicked out. 
One minute? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, I'm allowed to go to the so bathroom in one minute. All you people that have been here for like an hour longer than you needed yeah, to be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, people. Hey, um, th yes, thank you very much. Um, well, I've, I've gathered I, these I was say intelligent, something. articulate, sexy gentlemen yeah. uh, together uh, many times over the past couple of years, twice for DEF CON, and I'm fucking sick of this. So let's give them all a last word, move over, see what Martin and Rich Mogul, uh, a.k.a. the um, Travelocity Gnome, have to say in their 250th podcast, catch the... Uh, somehow I was excluded from ju from participating, but I'll be judging the uh, beard contest at six. There's all sorts of cool stuff happening tonight. I believe there is a uh, ten thousand cent hacker pyramid. Eight o'clock. My beard in? was quickly eliminated last night, but that's because my beard's not, not really good at hacker trivia. Dude, With that, uh, Mr. Arlen, let's give you the first last word. So you done yet? This is my, sec my second run at the last word. Uh, it is unbelievably imperative within, it is unbelievably imperative within the structure of the system that we have, that we do our damn best. And it's not sufficient just to do the job. We need to do the job well. And anybody who thinks that they can just do the job and walk away, you're a douchebag. Cut that shit out. Thank you, everyone. Are we moving down the list there? It's Miller time? Yeah. I think everything works perfectly, and we should just keep going like we're going. Josh, say something about Lilsec or something. No. Okay. Thank you. Beer time. Thank you.